Our next speaker <coughs> is uh, Mark Lene. <coughs> uh, he's one of the nation's uh, uh, experts uh, on uh, geriatrics and hospice and palliative care. Uh, he is the National Medical Director for Optum Health, and in that capacity, he oversees all clinical programs from wellness to mo complex medical conditions. He leads the company's performance team, which is accountable for clinical care and quality in the company's wellness, case management, and disease management programs. Uh, in, he works in complex medical uh, condition management and clinical performance of uh, external provider partners. Uh, previously, uh, he was uh, Chief Medical Officer uh, for the Medicare and Retirement Business for United Healthcare with accountability for clinical programs, payment policy, and network uh, relationships. Uh, he, is a board, uh, he is board certified in family medicine, geriatrics, and hospice and palliative care. He's a board member of the Long-Term Quality Alliance and sits on the quality uh, and research uh, committees of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Association. Uh, and he's a former director of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Please welcome Dr. Linnae. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I understand a lot of you are here, have been uh, to this conference multiple times. It's my first time, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm from Minnesota, where we share one thing in common, which is uh, a long history of uh, managed care. Uh, and where we don't share another thing in common, which is it was minus three degrees in Minnesota when I left. And uh, I believe they're getting six inches of snow today. So I am very happy to be uh, in Southern California uh, speaking to you today. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the physician shortage with uh, some overlap uh, with the other speakers and uh, a little bit of uh, um, uh, new thoughts and ideas, uh, I think, to stimulate uh, some great questions and conversations as we move through all the speakers. So I'm actually looking forward to the discussion uh, at the end of the talk, uh, which I find to be uh, very valuable. So, um, but I want to start with a, a, a bit of a, um, a challenge to you all and some observations in terms of what's happening in the healthcare system today. So um, our current system, with its lack of transparency and misaligned incentives, has actually created an oversupply of medical resources in many instances in this country. Um, this excess medical capacity is correlated with overutilization of services, and we know is a major driver of costs in the United States. And third, that greater per, per capita use of supply sensitive care and more spending do not result in lower mortality or improved quality of life, nor do they lead to improvement in the quality of care. And if you guys hopefully can see uh, on the right hand of the slide, uh, we have 203,000 physician offices in the United States and 100. 21,000 gas stations. Um, so we clearly do have medical physician offices on many street corners across the United States. And if you look below, um, and hopefully you can see it from everywhere in the room, uh, the, uh, the top graphic is um, our supply of uh, CT scan devices in the United States uh, relative to France, the UK, and uh, other developing countries across the globe, and our MRI uh, supply as well. And then in the lower graph, you can see the utilization of CT exams and MRI exams in the US relative to other countries around the globe. Uh, and there are multiple studies out in the, uh, in the literature uh, supporting the fact that the more supply we have, the more demand we create uh, in our medical system today. And uh, so we have a, a lot of challenges from not only the supply side, but the demand side, if we're ever going to fix this problem, because uh, we can't train enough primary care docs to do this or fix this. And I speak as a primary care doc who did full scope family medicine from delivering babies all the way through geriatrics and hospice and, and uh, hospice care for 10 years uh, before uh, moving into uh, academics and then uh, to Optum. So my agenda today is just basically to walk you through five or six slides focused on a few things. I'm going to give you a little bit more of who Optum is because uh, I always get questions about this. And then I'm going to focus on three trends, convergence in the healthcare sector and show you some comparisons to some other industries because I think if you think about it in this context, it'll give you a new perception of, of where the trends may come from because I think some of the solutions are going to come out of left field. I think five to 10 years from now, we're going to be very surprised in terms of who's in this space and, and who's moving into this space with solutions. Um, what the focus on quality does mean and doesn't mean, and uh, we are now um, a little bit in the tyranny of the measurable 
uh, and some of the stuff that we're measuring may be counterintuitive. Um, we know this in a lot of the uh, um, uh, quality ratings we do that uh, physicians tend to chase those uh, quality metrics and miss other opportunities. And we know from some of the literature in the complex populations that we may actually cause more issues than we solve um, by managing to tight hemoglobin A1Cs as one example in certain populations. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about increasing consumerism and transparency, which I think will change this world. I think as consumers get more transparency to the data and the information and the outcomes, uh, which is coming, um, because if we don't bring it to consumers, others will, um, that uh, it will change the game. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I view this problem from a, uh, and I know there's some economic folks here, from a demand side versus a supply side, uh, and, uh, and how we should think about solutions. So United Health Group is combined with, uh, comprised of two companies. United Health Care is our insurance side. Um, many of you are very familiar with UHC. We have an employer and individual business, a community and state business focused on largely Medicaid, a Medicare and retirement business, and we also have a military business. And you know we've now got TRICARE in the West, which uh, should have been uh, on this slide. And then on the left side, um, um, our Optum businesses, uh, which really are technology solutions, uh, and, uh, intelligent and decision support tools, health management uh, interventions, um, administrative services, and pharmacy solutions. And, uh, and we touch a broad uh, spectrum of the U.S. population. Um, Optum really is comprised of three legacy businesses. Our health information technology and consulting group, which focuses on keeping the healthcare system connected. Um, we're the leader in population health management, uh, focused on intelligent solutions. And then our PBM, which actually is here in Irvine, uh, our pharmacy management business um, with, uh, with staff in California. So here are some examples of some industry transformers I challenge folks to think about. Um, I do think our industry is transforming itself, and uh, we're either going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. Um, if you look at the financial services business in 1980, which was not all that long ago uh, for many of us who are baby boomers in the audience, um, less than 6% of U.S. households invested directly in the stock market. Today, over 54% of U.S. households do that, and there are many more direct-to-consumer uh, available options than there were uh, 25 years ago. 80% um, of uh, the U.S. auto market share was the big three in 1980. Uh, we now have uh, other competitors in the marketplace, and Toyota has moved in and out of the largest auto manufacturer in the world. FedEx transformed the uh, uh, overnight delivery system business, and if folks ever want to read a great article about the guy who got a, a C or C minus paper, I think, at Harvard, uh, who designed FedEx. It's a great read. Um, technology and media, um, this, a cell phone, a computer, and a Walkman cost $18,000 in 2012 dollars. Um, and uh, most of us couldn't imagine uh, not having our uh, smartphones in our pockets. And then um, US medical health expenditures are skyrocketing and uh, have moved from $1,100 per capita to $8,400, or a 657% uh, increase. Uh, and um, with that kind of expenditure out there, many folks are going to be interested, increasingly interested in moving into this market space and looking for solutions. So um, this is an example of convergence in the technology industry. Uh, in the past, we had a group of businesses that, operate, that ran operating systems and platforms. We had a group that produced hardware. We had a group that did content aggregation and creation. And we had a group of cellular network businesses. And what happened? Um, it converged. They were able actually to pull all of those solutions into, into uh, one um, uh, deal. And uh, as you guys remember, AT&T had uh, exclusivity with the Apple iPhones when they first came out. Um, uh, the Amazon Kindle became a content uh, delivery mechanism. So uh, people were buying it not for the device, and in fact, Amazon losing money on the Kindle, but making money on what they supply through that device. And the number one search engine in the world is, no, is actually in the, especially in the millennium generation, is not Google. It's actually YouTube. That's where most uh, young people go to look for information today. So what's hap what could happen in the healthcare space? Who is starting to move into the healthcare delivery space? And who could actually be presenting very different solutions for consumers who are looking to get their healthcare problems solved? Um, because they want it quick, easy, efficient. Um, and there's a broad population of folks looking to do that. 
um, and who is moving into the healthcare space. Um, we're going to hear from Walgreens, who's uh, doing a lot of work in uh, retail clinics, Google, Amazon. Um, you've seen the med some medical group convergence, the hospital systems. Um, we've, we know the exchanges are going to create new opportunities for healthcare systems potentially to move into um, um, selling insurance packages, um, and then the benefits business um, are re-looking at how they deliver care. So um, there is a huge um, opportunity uh, in this marketplace with the amount of money that's out there uh, for folks to come up with different solutions um, to solve healthcare problems. And uh, we, today I think we're largely taking a U.S. point of view, um, but uh, there are also international people interested in coming up with medical solutions in the U.S. market because of the amount of money that is available in this marketplace. So it is a very big um, potential box in terms of who, who wants to play in the space because of the amount of money that's out there. The second trend is um, payers are increasingly focusing on quality. Uh, it is a, uh, increasingly becoming a quality and not a, uh, a volume-based uh, business. This is not news to anyone in the audience. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk about waste. Um, one of the challenges with waste is how is waste defined. Uh, we've seen this in a lot of uh, public policy discussions and debate in terms of what percentage of, of um, health care spending is focused on waste. So I threw a slide up here to just kind of look at how waste is defined because we typically don't hear this talked about in public policy debates in terms of splitting it out. But if you look at the bucket of what most people define as waste, which is the cost of potentially avoidable clinical expenditures, about 6% is due to preventable conditions. Another 6% um, due to lack of care coordination. 12% due to provider inefficiency and errors. Another 17% due to administrative system inefficiencies. About 19% due to fraud and abuse. And about 40% is due to unwarranted utilization. And as soon as we start talking about this bucket, what do we get into? We get into debates about rationing. We get into debates about somebody else making decisions about me on my health care that I don't want them to make. Um, so I just want to point out that fraud and abuse is only a sliver of this broader potential spend of quote unquote waste. And if we don't figure out how we can handle the unwarranted utilization and, and speak about it and debate about it as a, as a country, uh, we're going to have a, a challenge going forward. Um, the most important controllable contributor of the high cost of US health care is overutilization. And it continues to, to ramp up quickly in front of us. So employers are asking. Um, for uh, ways to address quality and cost variability in medical spend. Um, and we have seen uh, work in, in our company. We do a lot of work with centers of excellence where we identify um, programs uh, and health systems that have uh, more appropriate utilization patterns and are more efficient um, uh, providers of services. For instance, our transplant networks, which we subcontract to 16% of payers across the country, where you can actually select the center you want to get your organ transplant at. And uh, we will give you a debit card for you and your partner to go to that center and have your transplant done. And, and we know those centers have much uh, more uh, appropriate outcomes. They have much fewer complications. And uh, it's a high satisfier for both the individual who gets their transplant and, and their partner. And the healthcare systems uh, thrive in that environment. And they report on their data through a national registry uh, that we pull the data off of. Um, and the, flip, the problem is transplant is a very high cost, low volume procedure. So it's tough to extrapolate that into other uh, interventions. And the metrics for measuring success are fairly well defined, patient survival and organ survival. And um, as we move into um, other ways of measuring outcomes, um, it gets more challenging to determine you know, what an effective outcome is. And consumers struggle to understand what those outcomes are. But as we can create more transparency to them, they will make and do make um, decisions based on some of that information. And then creating great, greater transparency to uh, physician adherence to evidence-based guidelines. Um, and we need to make sure that those guidelines are accurate and appropriate, um, or we can create uh, misincentives in the system. And then finally, looking at how we uh, uh, define incentives and benefits to encourage employees and individuals to uh, visit um, high quality providers. And we need to move from just measuring quality and efficiency to actually um, utilization patterns. So it's less interesting to me that Dr. Smith does a knee surgery for 80% of what Dr. Jones does than Dr. Jones does half as many knee surgeries as Dr. Smith because Dr. Jones 
actually uses conservative non-surgical management and has the same outcomes at one year uh, relative to the, to the other provider who does it at a slightly lower cost because they're doing such high volumes and, in fact, healthier patients. Um, they can have better outcomes. So we've got to look at utilization patterns as well. The third trend, and again, kind of going back to the financial sector, in the financial industry, um, you've got a consumer, an advisor, you've got specialists who support that, you've got good transparency to uh, the outcomes of your financial decisions, and uh, you've got a supplier who is supplying those resources to you. Uh, I would ask the question of this group, who's that going to be in the healthcare industry? Um, is in, in the past, it has been the physician. The physician has supplied a lot of these services to, uh, to the consumer. Um, is the consumer going to continue to want to get all that information from the, the physician? I believe not. I think the younger generation increasingly and many of the rest of us are looking at other resources for information besides our docs and PCPs. Um, there is a potential that PC, even PCPs will become a commodity and, uh, and we can see some of this happening in the specialty space as well. Uh, where they're gathering information elsewhere and they're going in to just have their, uh, their intervention done. Um, so um, who is going to move into those spaces? Who is going to supply that information? Who is going to um, um, be able to give those consumers better data? And how much are consumers going to learn from each other? And what's the difference between satisfaction and quality? We were talking about this a little bit at dinner last night, um, that you, can, you, know, you trust somebody else. If you can read five reviews of a restaurant or a hotel online, you get some sense of what that restaurant or hotel is like. I wouldn't trust five other consumers evaluating a doctor and making my decision whether or not to go to that doc. So how is that going to look? Because we are going to see more physician reviews online. And how is that going to impact supply? And what is that relationship between satisfaction and quality of outcomes? So our agenda um, at Optum, demand side solutions, reducing demand through prevention, wellness, and disease management. And this is a big challenge. Um, Obesity is likely to be the, obesity is likely to cause us to have a generation of children who are going to have a lower life expectancy than we do unless we can come up with solutions to solve that problem. And I would argue that PCPs are not going to solve the obesity epidemic in the United States. So what are the other um, solutions we need to do as a, uh, as a country to solve some of these major issues? However, there are many solutions out there to help individuals get and stay healthy and reduce downstream use of healthcare systems, including new technologies around consumer engagement. So rather than doing health risk assessments to determine what conditions people have, we should be doing health risk assessments to determine their level of engagement with the healthcare system. Because obviously the strategies are going to be different depending on their level of engagement and interest in making changes in their behaviors. Um, there are a lot of new technologies emerging. We don't even know what they all are yet, um, some, of whom, some of which are going to leapfrog us ahead. Uh, we've seen that with cell phones in, the, in developing countries where Text messages are actually delivering um, healthcare news to consumers. Um, and incentives will increasingly be an issue with consumers, anywhere from formal incentives to um, HSAs and HRAs, where consumers have more dollars in their hands to make their own healthcare decisions. And then innovative partnerships, looking for folks other than PCPs to help improve outcomes in care. And I'll challenge you to think about compliance as one example, where with our Diabetes Prevention Control Alliance, we're partnering with pharmacies and YMCAs and other partners to help consumers be more compliant. I would argue that it's not a physician's job to spend a lot of their time focusing on member compliance. There are other resources in the system that we need to use to help people be compliant. And then addr addressing the overutilization of medical services through better decision support tools and provider selection tools. So uh, we increasingly are delivering tools to the consumer to help them understand their condition and what evidence-based medicine and best practices are. We've been successful in um, discussing whether or not um, orthopedic surgery should or shouldn't be done uh, relative to the conditions a member may have, and then providing transparency to consumers to help them um, make better decisions that are not just based on satisfaction. And then I think this is my last slide, talking about supply side solutions. So how do we promote better access to healthcare providers? Um, our Providers going to be open to other solutions in terms of delivering efficient care. Uh, as we move to more risk-based contracts and panel-based care, um, are we going to um, free up physicians to be able to take a quick phone call from a member around their care where they typically don't get reimbursed today or access a provider online through something like our Now Clinic website where you can go online or through chat and get care. And, you know, we've got millennials that chat, literally chat with docs. That's all they want to do, quick chat. They're in their office, on their computer and they want to get their health care that way. They don't want to run in 
um, they want to get uh, those services quickly, which also helps us with some of our rural access issues. And then um, use of ancillary providers and physician extenders um, as appropriate. And we're starting to see them move into chronic and complex disease management, which is a new area that uh, I think we'll hear a little bit about. And then finally, uh, empowering consumers to better manage their health themselves. Um, some of them want to be empowered, some don't. I think there'll be a variety of acceptance of the technology, as was spoken about. Um, but I think um, um, Patients Like Me is a great example of a website where, where individuals with very complex conditions are actually entering all their clinical data around their conditions, all their subjective data. And because of the, the, the big data that's in there, you actually can get valid statistics in terms of which drugs are working for certain subpopulations of folks with, with nuanced data in mass that's actually very relevant as compared to what may or may not be in an EMR. And, uh, and then what are the community resources we need to bring to bear to manage this population, which uh, we're seeing now as the MME and some of the duals opportunities in particular emerge where folks have many more functional psychosocial geriatric syndrome issues than they have medical and health issues. And those are the issues that are actually driving utilization more than their medical care, their inability to, to stay at home, maintain their care at home, and get their social supports. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here and look forward to questions later.